Hello everyone, today we're going to be taking a look at how to create this quick little game of life experiment inside of a Ruby on Rails application. This is going to be a small little series that I'm doing. They might just be some bonus episodes uh, as, in addition to what we normally do, where we just step through some of the logic for game of life and maybe do some extra stuff with Action Cable to broadcast it and have real-time communication while this is happening. But in this first one, I just want to create the canvas with the logic for the actual game of life. It's a pretty quick little experiment that allows you to do uh, a couple different button actions and stuff. Uh, and then in a future episode, we'll take a look at making it so people can uh, play the game together. As you can see in the terminal, I've already sort of done a little bit. That's a spoiler. Just uh, don't don't look at that too closely. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to get started by creating a new Rails project. We're going to say Rails new, I'll call mine video, and then we'll CD into our video afterwards. So the basic premise for the game of life is you're going to have a couple of rules you need to follow for each of the cells. If the cell follows the rules, it might stay alive. If the cell doesn't follow the rules, it might uh, be made unalive, I'm trying to stay monetized here. Uh, but overall, oops, let me do a code dot. Uh, overall, uh, the only really complicated thing that a lot of people mess up when they first implement it is you don't want to modify the cell in place while you're checking if it should be alive or not based on how many neighbors it has. You want to like modify a copy of it and then update it afterwards. Okay, so to get started, we'll do a Rails G controller pages home. We're just going to be doing a home page for this one. And we're gonna be doing a Rails G stimulus and we'll just call the controller the life controller. Okay, now that we have that, we're gonna go ahead and come into our config and our routes.rb. We're gonna change this root uh, to be the pages controller and the home action. Next, we can come into our app, our views, our pages, and our home page. And in our home page, we're gonna be setting up a little bit of stimulus logic. I'll just go ahead and paste this in. I'll hit control plus and F11 so you can see what we're doing here. So we start by creating a content tag for a div with nothing inside of it. We link it to that life stimulus controller we just made right here. Uh, this one, just the, the part before the underscore is all we need. We then tell it there's a content tag with a canvas inside of it, which is set to a stimulus target. It is the name of the controller underscore target and then the canvas. And then we have uh, some buttons here. So this canvas is what we're drawing to. These buttons are gonna be what's modifying it. Now we could additionally use some stimulus logic here for some of the modifications that we're doing and how we're selecting like the start button. Uh, but in all honesty, getting the uh, ID selection to work sometimes can just be a pain. So we're just doing it with an ID. Uh, but yeah, so basically we have this, we have the buttons here, and then we have the on-click listeners that we're gonna be creating inside of the life controller. We could add those at the top here, uh, but I thought this might be a better way to do it. Uh, so we're gonna come into our life controller and we're just gonna quickly implement this. Now, the first thing we have to do is actually import a uh, additional object we're gonna create called cell. So we'll come up to JavaScript, create a new folder. We'll just call this, uh, I guess I called it life. And then inside of life, we'll create a new file and call it cell.js. Inside of the cell.js, we need to uh, create a JavaScript object. So this is gonna be a class of, uh, called cell with the export default so that we can import it. We then give it a with a height, a alive color and an unalive color. So this is essentially your background color and this is the color when the cell is alive. Next, we create a constructor and optionally you can set it to be randomly alive or not inside of this constructor. For our sake, we don't do that and we just instead tell it that the alive is initially set to the false unless we pass something in later. And this really isn't useful now, uh, but when we start messing around with action cable in a future video, uh, this could be uh, pretty useful. So now we have to tell it how it should be able to draw itself because we're gonna be calling cell.draw whenever we iterate through our, our grid. And for that, we have a draw call here where we say this.context.fill style is equal to a ternary based on whether or not the cell is alive or not. So if it's alive, we use the alive color. And if it's not, we use the unalive color. For the context here, we tell it there's a fill rect and we tell it to use the width and the height that we used so that in the case where it's like a 10 by 10, it creates a 10 by 10 little block. 
So the final thing we really have to do here is implement a way when we're iterating through the grid to check on its neighbors. So we'll come back over to our life controller real quick. And then when we get to that part, we'll move back into our cell to implement that logic. Now inside of our controller here, we need to declare a stimulus targets list for our canvas. That is this canvas right here with the life target of canvas, which is how we're selecting it. And then once we have that, we can set the canvas target. We can grab the context. We can tell it, this is again, HTML, uh, uh, HTML canvas stuff right here, the, the logic for it. We can then tell it has a width of 72 and a height of 480 just because I thought if each one's gonna be 10 pixels, this gives us something that vaguely maintains some semblance of an aspect ratio. So the next thing we can do here is we can tell it, all right, are you running or not? So we'll say running is set to false initially. Next, we can tell it to create the mouse handlers. And then this is where we do our logic for the uh, event handler. So we're actually gonna have two pieces of logic here. I'm gonna just paste these in. Uh, because they're largely similar. So for our mouse handlers, we tell it that mouse press is set to false because we're gonna be checking whether or not the mouse button's clicked or not. We then disable the ability to right click, uh, which opens up this context menu. So we disable this context menu. So if you right click, you can delete cells without it causing the pop-up. And we just do that by calling event.preventDefault inside of the context menu. We then have a mouse down and mouse up function. Both of these are basically just gonna be setting this, uh, this mouse pressed Boolean uh, to either true or false. So if you are, if your mouse is held down and you're like dragging it, then we wanna set mouse pressed to true. And as soon as you let go, we wanna set it to false again. We then check if you're moving your mouse, which is where we actually check, is the mouse pressed? If it is, then we wanna draw something. And then in our disconnect, it's all of those things, but in reverse, we're just removing the listeners for it so that we clean up after ourselves. Okay, so that's effectively it for our mouse handlers. Now let's go ahead and let's create our empty grid. We can then go ahead and initialize this grid, and then we'll take a look at what initializing the grid actually means. It's gonna be another function. I'm gonna actually collapse these two, come down here and create this. So for the init grid, we iterate through all of the width, for each of the width, we create a array. And then inside of all of our heights, we set the grid dot X and Y equal to a new cell. And because it's set to alive as false by default, all of these will just be a background colored cell. Once that's done, we can then go ahead and create our draw loop. And then inside of our draw loop, we, uh, I mean, really all I have in here for logic right now is just a call to an animate grid which does make you question why you would even need the draw grid in the first place. Uh, but let's go ahead and let's run this animate grid. So in here, we have an animate grid. Effectively, just conserving the context as we get into here, which is why it's defined a little bit differently. That just allows us to do some stuff because we're going to be using a timeout. Speaking of timeouts, we'll put the timeout at the bottom here. And all this is going to do is make sure that this only updates once every, uh, every tenth of a second. And then whatever logic's in here, we can just go ahead and run. So for every 10th of a second, we wanna make sure we clear the uh, canvas and we wanna make sure that we tell it uh, if, if it's running, it should check its neighbors. So what does this check neighbors function actually do? Well, if we come down here, we can define it and the check neighbors just goes through each of the X's, each of the Y's, and it calls this.gridxy.checkneighbors. That's that function I told you we had to implement. Well, I guess in this case, it's, it's more of a method, but you get the idea. You can come down here and we can save, or we can put the check neighbors in here. We'll leave the uh, method versus function debate for r slash programmer humors because uh, we got better things to do. Okay, so in here, we define a list of neighbors, which we get from this method right here, which is called get neighbors. So let's go ahead and let's define that. Now get neighbors looks scary, but all we do is we create a list of neighbors. We then iterate from its negative one to its first uh, element nearby. Same for the Y's. If it's equal to zero, zero, we know it is the element itself. We can't check it if it's its own neighbor because we know it is it, which is confusing. But basically if we're looking at the element that we're checking the neighbors for, we can just skip it. 
We then say, all right, our neighbor X is equal to this dot grid X plus X, which is gonna be like, if it's negative one, it'll be the left one. Uh, if it's Y, it'll be like the one above it, etc. We then say, if the neighbor is uh, to the left is greater than or equal to zero, and the neighbor to the right is the, the grid length, uh, if effectively all we're doing here is we're saying if it's inside the bounds of the grid, right? So if this neighbor is in the grid itself, we add it to the list of neighbors. So it's your extremes here. So if it's, uh, if it's greater than or equal to zero, if it's less than the grid length or uh, same thing for the Y's. We now know we have the list of neighbors, so we can go through this list of neighbors and we can say, all right, let's get the alive neighbors by filtering through our list of neighbors. And we just check if the cell is alive and then we get the length of it. We then say, is the alive neighbors less than two or is the alive neighbors greater than three? In that case, we need the cell to be set to false for alive. So what does this mean? It means if you only have one neighbor, uh, you you kind of just like i think the the thing is you you just don't have enough to reproduce and if you have more than three neighbors i think the logic is it's like it, it starves maybe uh else if we have exactly three neighbors and we are not alive or we just we are already live we just set this to true the logic being here if there's three neighbors with an empty cell uh, we probably want to set that cell to, to alive so that we get some sort of reproduction or something, right? So that's our logic in our cell here. We can then come over to our life controller again uh, because we're pretty much done at this point. So we, we set our check neighbors. We now need to say, uh, let's go through this and draw these. So we come in here, we say for let x equal zero, less than width, y equals zero, less than height, uh, draw the grid. And then at this point, we've now drawn our grid. The only thing we really have left to do is to actually do the mouse logic. Now the mouse logic is quite a bit here, uh, but I'll walk you through it. So the first thing we do is we have our mouse down event. This is just setting the mouse pressed equal to true. And then it calls a function called click logic for our mouse up event. It does the same thing, except it's set to false. And then it calls click logic. For our mouse move, we check if mouse is pressed. If it is, we call click logic. For our actual click logic method or function, we then say here's our click logic. It takes in an event, which all of these are passing in. It grabs the X and the Y based on where you clicked in the canvas divided by the cell width and height. So it's like 400 wide, so you click on the fourth cell. So it grabs the uh, 40 there, divides everything by the width of the cells, which might be 10. And then you know it's the fourth cell over, even if it's 40 pixels over, something like that. Then we call this dot toggle cell by button, which takes in an X and a Y and the event buttons. This is just how we're checking if our left or right button was clicked uh, because we have two, button, two mouse buttons we're using. So toggle cell by button takes in an X and a Y. If it's the, uh, if the buttons is equal to one, it's the left mouse button. So we set the alive to true for this cell. If the buttons is equal to, to false, we set the alive to false. And then in here, all we're doing for each of these click events is we're saying, look, you've clicked the button. We are gonna set mouse press to true, but we also wanna make it so if you click without moving your mouse, we are updating our cells alive status. Without this call to these click logics here, you would have to click and then move your mouse a little bit to get the cell that your mouse is over to be toggled if you click, because we don't have an on click listener here. So that's sort of what we're emulating and why we call it in both the mouse down and the mouse ups. Okay, so that takes care of that. Now the other thing we have to do is deal with our buttons, but let's go ahead and let's save this, come over here and uh, run our server with a Rails S to see how much it's gonna yell at us. We'll go ahead and refresh. And now if we click and we drag, we can see this dot toggle cell is not a, not a function. So I should probably go ahead and implement that, right? Well, it's actually not that bad. We can just go ahead and paste this in. A toggle cell takes in an X and a Y and an alive. It sets the X and Y to alive equal to whatever was passed in. Uh, oops, and this is a spoiler. And then we're good to go. So it's just a one line function. We can go ahead and refresh. I have to refresh a little bit harder because it thinks there's still a uh, action, uh, action cable connection that it needs to find. 
Uh, and apparently there is still another one running somewhere. Let me just go ahead and close that. There we go. So now if we click and we drag, we're drawing. You can see it's only updating every so often because we have it set to update on like 100 milliseconds or whatever, I think. Uh, in our timeout, it's set to 100 milliseconds. But we're at least drawing. So now let's get the start clear and random working. This part's actually not that bad. All we do is when we click those buttons, remember in here we have the data bound to a start, a clear, and a random function. If we click the start button, we set this dot running equal to a not this dot running. The start target is equal in this case to the event dot target. Uh, but what we can actually do up here is we can grab this element by its ID. Uh, I I don't I don't know where I have that code exactly over here. Uh, but what we can do is we can just say like this dot start button is equal to document get element by ID and it is the start button ID. So we can now come down here and grab this and inside of our uh, running check here when we do the start target, instead of doing the event target, we'll grab the uh, start button and we can do a start button .inner text, do that and then we can get rid of this part right here. So what we're doing is we're just setting the running status equal to the inverse of it, and then we're telling it to set the text here. But what I'm actually going to do is abstract this, and I'm just going to call this dot set start button or this dot toggle start button text, and then we can do a toggle start button text here, something like that. This is just a bit of a live refactor that we're doing here. Now we can go ahead and call the clear function, which we'll do right up here. And instead of doing these posts, we don't need that. After we're done here, we're gonna call this dot toggle start button text because we're setting running to false in here. And then we just say, all right, for each of the X and the Y, set the alive equal to false. The final thing we do is we create that random function which is just setting this dot running equal to false. We'll grab this toggle again and we'll paste it in here and get rid of the spoilies. And then for the random, we go through the X and the Y. We just set the alive equal to a math dot random greater than 0.5. So basically you have like a 50% chance plus or minus some change uh, to have the cell be alive when you click it. So let's come over here, let's click start. You'll see nothing happens. If I draw though, you'll see it starts to animate. Of course, these things animate like this, but if I come in here and click somewhere, you can see that the logic changes. So right here we have, uh, this one has one, two, three neighbors. We can give it a fourth one. Now we can see with an, uh, four neighbors, it's, uh, it's no longer alive, but they kind of stay alive themselves. So we get those cool little bits of logic. Now, of course, we can also clear it. We can click random and random generate something else. It'll just do this for us. And the other thing we can do is if we clear it, we can draw and then we can right click to erase. We can click start. If we click clear, it toggles the start button text. If we click random, it toggles it. If we click random again, it's it toggles it and stops it. So we're handling all of that logic. So yeah, this is effectively all I wanted to do for this first video, just because uh, it, it sets up some of the cooler stuff we can do in a follow up video with uh, act, action cable, uh, which will allow us to do uh, some pretty fancy stuff, I think. So for now, thank you for watching and hopefully I will see you in the follow-up video.